machine learning, AI, deep learning, engineering in a biotech firm. Chemical engineers can do anything. In high school, were you kind of taking the chemistry route? Was that the vision? What I actually wanted to be in high school, an animator actually. How did you come out of high school and abandon the animation? I was talking to a buddy and he was telling me about this class where they get to build little cars. They had to be chemically powered. What did you do after that? Uh, I decided that I could do summer sales. Hi, and welcome to the Reiterate Show. Thanks for giving us a watch or a listen from wherever you are in the world. Our goal with this show is to introduce you to people who have gone through setbacks in their lives while they pursue happiness and fulfillment. Through these interviews and these conversations, hopefully you'll see that we are all capable of bouncing back and achieving greatness. Enjoy the conversation. Josh Staker, a good friend of mine, uh, based out of Portland, Oregon, and is a deep learning, machine learning expert. You've been doing that for a number of years. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thanks so much for being here, Josh. Yeah, thanks, David. Really happy to be here and have a awesome conversation with you. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot about your background, but I wouldn't say I know the specifics and machine learning, AI, deep learning, engineering in a biotech firm, that's like, you know, 10 feet above my head. So uh, I try to grasp the stories you tell me and the projects you're working on. I do my best. I am curious to learn a little bit more and I'm excited to hear your story. So you're based out of Portland, Oregon, and, um, and you've been in that world, in that industry for a number of years, is that right? Yeah, so I first started at Schrodinger, I think it's been almost seven years now, six or seven years, something like that. And is this what you wanted to do coming out of school? What was your undergrad in? What did you study? Yeah, so my undergrad was in chemical engineering, which has some similarity to what I'm doing, um, but surprisingly very little. Um, so I didn't have quite enough chemistry background and basically zero programming experience, which is what I do most of my time doing at work now. After college, mostly of what I wanted to do was actually on the business side. I kind of wanted to abandon my engineering technical side and go more into the business route. Um, and then it was just kind of this back and forth play between my interests until I finally kind of settled on the, the technical side for that time um, and then ended up in Schrodinger where I spend a lot of my time programming and very much in depth in the, the science uh, technical side. Chemical engineering, that sounds very specialized to me. I mean, I knew, I had friends who did chemical engineering and uh, a lot of those chemistry classes in college. And I felt like they were the same people who in high school also were able to take, you know, some of those advanced chemistry courses. Is that your case in high school? Were you kind of taking the chemistry route? Was that the vision even as a kid in high school? Not at all, actually. So I did take science in high school. I did pretty okay in chemistry, but it wasn't like it was my all-time favorite class. What I actually wanted to be in high school was an artist, and an animator actually, and go work for Pixar. So I spent a lot of my time doing computer graphics and animation. Um, wow. So I had some familiarity with uh, the science side and I was pretty okay at it, but that certainly wasn't my dream um, coming out of high school. To animate for Pixar on the computer, what programs were you using? So back then, um, mostly 3ds Max is what I had experience with, and then later on I had a little bit of experience with Maya as well. Never heard of those programs. Those Are those uh, kind of a step above the Adobe suite? Uh, different than Adobe. So Adobe, um, I'm actually not too well versed in Adobe, but I know that they do a lot of the 2D type stuff, like Photoshop for pictures, and then you have like After Effects for like um, editing and uh, adding effects and stuff to video. And this is more like 3D design. Maya is for like designing the, the 3D models and all of the uh, stuff that goes into making those animated. And what changed? How did you come out of high school and abandon the animation, the artist's journey into a more very strict science major? After high school, I had the privilege of spending a couple of years in another country doing service. And that was a really amazing and eye-opening opportunity for me. And it was in a country that was on the opposite side of the world. And when I came back from that experience, I 
had a desire to you know find something that I could do to help other people and I didn't know exactly what that was going to look like um, I knew I could be a doctor but really didn't feel like medical school was for me and I was kind of in this process of discovery um, when I was first starting college and I was mostly signed up for general classes you know your histories and your Englishes um, when I was first starting out in school and I had a history class that I signed up for and I went to class that first day and the instructor said or actually wasn't even an instructor it was a student I guess like a teaching assistant and he said I apologize but really unusual circumstances but the professor who is going to teach this class has taken extremely ill and this whole class is going to be canceled there wasn't oh, wow. even going to be like a substitute instructor or anything it was just outright canceled huh uh, yeah so very unusual circumstance and so i had this block in my schedule that i needed to scramble and find some way to fill that yeah. and i was on the bus ride home to my uh, apartment and i was talking to a buddy and he was telling me about this class where they get to build little cars for the semester and race them at the end and they had to be chemically powered. And it was a chemical engineering class. Yeah. And to be honest, I was like 21 years old at that time and I didn't even really know what an engineer was. Yeah. Like I was in my 20s, I didn't really know what an engineer was. But huh. I thought, you know, that class sounds kind of interesting. And I asked him, you know, when is that class? When is the, the time for that class? And it was just in the exact time slot of this class of mine oh. that was canceled. Yeah. Um, so definitely some, um, you know, universal lining there for me. Um, yeah, so I signed up for the class, I took it, and um, one of the things that I looked at on the schedule was plant design. I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool. I get to learn biology and design plants, you know, whatever that might look like. But come to find out, it was more like industrial plants, you know, refineries oh, yeah. and that kind of thing. So <laughs> I was a little disappointed about that, but um, yeah, I stuck it out, I took the class, and I just decided to commit and I followed it all the way through to graduation. Wow. So because of that one canceled class, it basically changed the course of your entire study and then I assume career choices after. Yeah, so I was in this process of discovery, trying to figure out, you know, how could I help people? And it kind of just fell on my lap where I said, all right, this looks good, I'm gonna run with it. And I just did. And when you took that first chemical engineering class, did you connect? Did you have any special connections with the instructor or the teachers? Or did you say you had a friend in that class? Was there was there something beyond the material that kept you in that? Or was it really just you cracked open the book, learned that it was designing chemical plants, and then you became enthralled with that? Why did you stick it out that first class? Good question. I haven't really thought about, you know, yeah. why, why did I stick around? I don't think that the material ever was enough to keep me committed. Like I found the material interesting, but it wasn't what really sold me. Yeah. What really sold me, I think, was the relationships. Like I had yeah. some really good friends in the class, really smart people. And I felt like I was never quite as smart as they were, but you know, I was always learning from them. And the teacher was really engaging. He was this young guy, had a lot of energy and he just made it really exciting. But what really sealed the deal for me was a month or two into the class, I was looking for a part-time job and I went to the department and I asked the secretary there, I wanna work for one of the professors, who should I go talk to? And she pointed me to an office and I walked into the office and I said, I'm so-and-so and you know I'm looking for work. And this is actually fairly unusual to have not only an undergrad, but a freshman you know, engage in a research lab. You know, usually they look for people with a little bit more experience. And so the professor was quite questioning, you know, trying to understand my motivation, you know, am I desperate for rent and I'm doing anything yeah. I can to Need anything. make rent. <laughs> um, but that moment is one of the moments that changed my life because that professor, Ken Solon, was one of the most influential people that I've ever met in my entire life. And he remains a very close friend and mentor to this day. In fact, we were emailing um, back and forth, maybe not even just a couple months ago. So we've been in touch over the years. So anyway, I took a job in his lab and all four years of college, I spent in his lab. And the lessons he taught me were, were not about chemical engineering or, or science as much as it was how to be a good person and how to prepare myself for the real world. And I carry many of those lessons with me to this day. 
And the fact that he was a chemical engineer and what he told me was that chemical en engineers can do anything. He said, it doesn't matter so much what you're learning in the books, but it's learning how to learn and how to apply what you learn to make a difference in the world. And those are the lessons that really matter to me. So it wasn't so much what I was learning in the books and the classes, but that feeling and that motivation of, you know, I'm somebody, I'm worthwhile, and I can make a difference in this world. And that was huh. enough for me to, to stick it out. If somebody who were, who were to listen to this conversation, maybe they were your, in your shoes as a freshman in college, what would you say to them if they are kind of thinking about, you know, maybe they fell into a class or maybe they uh, have an idea of where they want to go with their career, but maybe there's a big question mark in their minds. You were in that spot at one point and you found your way out. What would you say to a person like that? Yeah, you know, looking back, I think that what was probably important for me was to be open to reframing my vision of what success was gonna look like or who I wanted to be. For example, I wanted to be an animator, a 3D animator, and you know, that would have been probably a really awesome career and I would have loved it. Um, or, you know, starting a chemical engineering class, you know, I didn't initially feel that the material was for me. You know, like I said, I wasn't really 100% committed in what was coming out of the pages of my textbook. But I think all along the way, I tried to have this openness of learning and exploring and finding the right people along the way that could help guide me. And so really the only piece of advice that I would provide on that point is, you know, you might think you know what you want in terms of a career or a degree, a particular type of degree, um, a particular employer that's really kind of your dream employer, anything that you like set out to be sort of your, your dream or your vision, be open to having that change and find people to talk to and get advice and iterate on that idea because you never know, you know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And you might learn some really important lessons along the way or fall into a class that you never would have expected or met your Ken Solons or your, your mentors as well that can guide you and change your life mm -hmm. and to be open to that and not so stubborn that you miss out on those opportunities. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. And also what, I've, what I'm hearing about your story is you know I've hired a lot of people in my life. I think you have as well, or you've you've uh, kind of been the manager of many people and, and teams and that type of thing. And what I'm hearing in your story that happened is that people want to help other people. So teachers and hiring managers and leaders at companies they want to help other people. You you mentioned you went away and you did some service in a different country and you had that desire that you wanted to make the best, you know, help the people that you were serving. And so I see that in the instructor, in the teacher who was your mentor. And um, having an open mind, if I'm putting these two pieces, these two ideas together, having an open mind, like you're saying, and being open to what's around you, and then having it also know that other people are out there who also want you to succeed. I understand that that's probably not the case 100% of the time, but when you're working hard and when you're seeking to do good things, you know, people kind of jump aboard and, and want to help you along. Would you say that was true with, with your mentor? Yeah, totally. Like, um, I think that I've talked to a lot of people and there's often this nervousness of, you know, they're busy, I don't want to take up their time. It's really one-sided of them giving to me and not being able to give in return. Um, but I've learned that there's many, many really good people out there that are eager to learn. And you might be surprised at how it can be win-win as well. So I'll give you one example of me um, being on the other side where I had the opportunity to uh, be a mentor as well. I met a young man and um, he had some questions about machine learning and I had some experience in machine learning. And so we were talking and um, he asked for some help on his high school science project and I was happy to help him out. And so I invited him over to my home and we were looking at what he was working on and I provided some suggestions. And he was very eager and it was very exciting because he'd call me up with a question and tell me you know, what he was discovering and I'd give him some tips and advice and it ended up being a really good experience for him. And he was very grateful for that for you know, many times he'd tell me and you know, I just found that very fulfilling. Well, a couple years later, he 
um, graduated from high school and he went to college. He's a student at Stanford right now. And um, he emailed me a couple years back and said, I'm looking for a summer internship. And things didn't really work out that year, but we kept in touch. And last summer I emailed him back and said, hey, do you want to come work for me for the summer? And he came on at where I'm working and I was his supervisor and we did machine learning together. Years later, after yeah, he'd gotten yeah. much experience and had, you know been going to school and stuff, yeah, and so yeah. it was this really cool relationship where we'd been working together for you know some years now, and it was very satisfying and fulfilling for me to see him, you know, go from you know having very little experience with it to being very uh, proficient with the tooling and really surprising me in the things that I was learning from him and what we were able to accomplish in a short period of time together. And so that's something that you know I may not have been able to anticipate when we had first met, yeah, but being yeah. willing to open up to him and him also being willing to come to me with those types of questions and building those types of relationships. That's cool. You uh, stick it out through a couple years of college and in the chemical engineering route. What'd you do after that? There's always been part of me that is an ideas man, I guess you can say. Um, I've always been attracted to entrepreneurship. Um, not so much in the sense where I want to be a business owner or you know, have a particular financial goal that I want to realize. I know that there's different motivations for being an entrepreneur, but I was really interested in the skill set of entrepreneurship. Um, the opportunity to go out and network and build relationships, uh, learn how to have an idea and a vision and prototype and iterate and realize that vision um, and bring others on uh, to help you realize success and then for them to share that success as well. I just love that whole process. And so uh, when it came time to graduate, being a chemical engineer, a lot of my classmates were going more the traditional route, like um, oil and gas industry is pretty common for chemical engineers or chemical manufacturing. And I explored potential jobs around uh, those opportunities, but I just didn't really feel that that was for me. And I really liked the idea of blending business and technology, um, but I didn't really have a lot of the technical experience. And around this time, I discovered that there was this new program, pretty much brand new. I think it had been around a year where some companies had collaborated in addition to um, NASA being involved as well. Um, and I think some universities were involved as well. I'm not exactly sure, but it was quite this network of collaboration. And it was held at NASA Ames campus in California, and it was all about blending business and technology. And I thought, wow, that'd be perfect for me because I can learn more about the tech side, which I'm not very familiar with, um, and also form connections and yeah. just that energy, really, really excited about yeah. that. Um, and so that was my senior year of college that I discovered this program and I went all in on it. Um, I didn't really worry a whole lot about applying to other companies and you know looking for other jobs as a backup plan. And you know, looking back, maybe I could have done a little bit more of that. But I really put all my time and effort preparing for this program. Um, I uh, was able to make some awesome connections. So I was able to connect to one of the program chairs and we had a good relationship and he said he'd try to help me out. And I was able to uh, leverage some other relationships I had and they were very gracious in helping uh, prepare for the program. Um, and I was very excited about it. I knew it was kind of a long shot though because they only took 80 people out of the whole world and they focused on diversity. So, you know, every country could only provide a few people and not just students, but even professionals with years of working experience. And so the, the um, pool of candidates was substantial. So I knew that my odds were, you know, quite slim, but I went for it anyway. And the day of word arrived. So I, I got news of the decision and it was an incredibly difficult thing to hear because I didn't get accepted, nor had I been rejected. I was put on the waiting list. Oh. So I was accepted for their waiting list. And so yeah. it was some excitement for me because, wow, you know, I kind of made it, you know, that was validation for me. But at the same, on the same token, um, I was kind of in this limbo land now of, you know, what do I do? Do I wait it out, if, you know, see if I get lucky and somebody isn't able to make it into the program and I'm able to replace them? Yeah. Or do I make some other decision and say, okay, let's cut our losses. It's time for me to look for work. Um, and pursue that instead. And I was graduating in April and the program was in June. So I had a couple of months where I had to 
um, figure out what I was going to do. If I was going to wait, I had to fill that time or, or do something else altogether. And so I decided I was going to go for it. I was going to make the leap of faith and uh, wait it out to see if being on the waiting list, I was going to get into the program. And um, what I decided to do to fill my time uh, through talking uh, to a friend, um, uh, I decided that I could do summer sales in, in the meantime to give myself something to do and make a little bit of money. Summer sales is a job that you took in the meantime where you would go out and what were you selling? Yeah, so that's a really good way to frame it. It was a temporary job that you know I wasn't super committal on, something that I could do, and then uh, you know change gears later on if I need yeah. to. Yeah, um, it was pest control. Yeah, and so I talked to the owner of the business and I explained my situation and I said, you know, um, here's this program. It's a really good fit for me, but I'm on the waiting list, and I'd love to come work for you for a couple of months but I would like to be able to leave if possible if I get accepted. And he was very kind and very gracious. And he said, uh, yeah, that sounds good. Um, but he said that if you know you don't end up going to the program, I'll need to know if you're gonna stick around for the rest of the summer or not. So I had until that day and then I would make a decision. And that yeah. seemed reasonable, right? Because then by then I'd know whether or not I was gonna go to the program yeah. and um, then I could make a decision. And so I did that. I went out to Omaha, Nebraska hmm. for a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, really great experience, actually. Um, and learned a lot. Learned a lot about being a salesman, actually. Things that I, yeah. you know, make sense now looking back, but I hadn't really anticipated. That wasn't my motivation for going and doing that. Um, but all kind of played a part in my personal journey to become an entrepreneur, to learn a little bit more about being a better salesman. and. You know, once again, good connections to learn along the way and mentors that can teach me and uh, really important lessons along the way. Um, and so the, the day of reckoning arrived. It was the day that the program was to start. Uh, I think it was first or second week of June. And that day came and went and I didn't get a phone call. No word. No word. And I thought, you know, that's it. I, w I was absolutely devastated because here I was, you know, in the middle of, to me, seemingly of nowhere. Yeah. And I had committed myself so strongly to this opportunity. I took the leap of faith and I did everything I thought I needed to do to realize this vision of mine. I thought it was such a perfect fit for me. And I made it so close, right? So far, so close. I was on the waiting list. Like yeah. I just needed some guy, which is unfortunate because somebody else would have missed out on the opportunity for me to be able to go, but you know, it's hard not to feel disappointed or, you know, lots of feelings that could be associated. Do you know how many people were on the waiting list though? Ah, good question. Uh, I know it was a very short list. I think it was maybe five or six. Oh. Um, not totally sure. And then that's a good question of where was I on the list, right? If I was like fifth or sixth. Who then... knows? Like I was thinking maybe they put a hundred people on the waiting list and five of them did get filled the spot, you know, filled the spots, but you were in spot number 33 and it just wasn't gonna happen. And, you know, I, if there was no way to tell, but if you knew there was only five or six, then yeah, it kind of is a little bit of insult to injury. I knew that it was very close. Like there was a good chance that I could be able to go. So did you, did you stick out the rest of the summer out in Nebraska? So I'll tell you, um, I called the business owner and I said, hey, look, here's the situation. I, I didn't get the phone call. And he was a very kind man. The first thing he said was, well, how are you feeling? Because he knew that I was gonna be pretty crushed. He knew yeah. that this is what I was aiming for. And I said, yeah, of course, you know, this is really hard. Um, but I said, you know what? I feel like I'm learning a lot of really good lessons here. Um, and I'm not really doing anything else right now. I, you know, I have a little bit of time to figure out what my next steps are going to be. So I committed. I decided that I was going to stick it out the rest of the summer. Yeah. But then a week later, so it was like five, five days or a week later, I got a phone call from the program and they said, Hey, we want to let you know that somebody's visa didn't go through and you're in the program. What? This is a, a week later. And I was filled with so many mixed emotions because 
you know, on the one hand, I felt elated, like this is my dream, you know, yeah. and it, it finally can be realized. But then things were also a little bit more complicated because um, on the one hand, they were already a week into the program and it was fast paced and, you know, it was an accelerated program. They were covering quite a bit. And, you know, so you couldn't help but feeling like you missed out a little bit on part of the opportunity. And, you know, maybe teams are already being formed. Yeah. And yeah. Those key initial networking and socializing opportunities. And, you know, it'd be very difficult to, you know, get up to speed so quickly and be part of that. But at the same time, you know, the relationships, those key relationships and those life changing experiences could have paid dividends for the rest of my life. And you, know, you can see how I'm talking in past tense. And the reason for that is because there was another thing that was very important and difficult for me. And that was because I had just committed to stick around for the rest of the summer. And this gentleman would have been probably very kind and very gracious and say, yeah, I totally go run, chase this opportunity. This is what you really want. But between missing out on those first key parts of the program and, you know, feeling like it maybe it was a matter of personal integrity, I decided maybe, you know, I shouldn't go in the end. And so I talked to the woman um, who called me for the program and I, you know, tried to explain, you know, my situation. And I asked, you know, is it possible that maybe I can come next year? And she said, you know, there's no guarantees, but since you've been accepted and we know who you are, there's a much higher likelihood that that's a possibility. And so I made the very hard decision to not go to the program that wow. summer. Wow. And so oh my I, gosh. I stuck it out as a summer salesman instead of going to this program at NASA Ames. Because you gave your word to the manager of the sales group that you're gonna do it. It was a small thing, but I felt like it was enough for me that I needed to stick it out. And, and I did. Huh. You are quite the man of integrity then. That is amazing. Well, I know there's times where, you know, maybe it's a little too stubborn, maybe I was a little too crazy, and maybe a quick conversation with the gentleman would have been all I needed. But in that particular case, you know, that's how I felt what I needed to do. And so that's what I did. Did you tell the woman on the phone, why didn't you call me last week when you said you were going to? <laughs> You know, I think I probably asked regarding the situation of why it was a week into the program. Yeah. And that must have been when I found out that it was because somebody's visa didn't come through. Oh, I so see. I think that they worked very, very hard to bring this individual into the program. And I can totally appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I feel like, you know, it would have been nice to have known some of those things earlier on in the process. But um, they were a brand new program and they were figuring yeah. things out as well. So, you know, we were all trying to figure it out together. When you didn't get the call, the first time around you said you were devastated and you were out in nebraska i assume with like other sales people living in an apartment or somehow they put you up somewhere were you even able to get out the next day and keep working like what, what did that week look like yeah well i didn't take any day off so that's for sure <laughs> okay. i just woke up and went back to work yeah. um my wife was out there with me fortunately so oh, we had okay. our own place. Married. Um, but uh, my wife, um, shortly thereafter, went to visit family back in our home state. So she was gone for nearly a month uh, for quite some time. And that was the longest we'd been apart. We were fairly newlyweds at the time. And so I, here I am in Omaha, Nebraska, by myself, feeling very lonely. And, you know, what do I do with the rest of my life? What did your wife think when this opportunity rose back up five days later and did she support your decision or was it like josh what are you doing this is your program you've been preparing for for a year of course you need to take this and you're like no no or what happened you know she's always been so amazingly supportive there was never a question or, or challenging my my vision for what we needed to do she was always supportive yeah. and not only supportive wow. but continuing to contribute to the vision as well, you know, and try and figure out what's next. And, you know, not looking so much in the past, but she was always there with me trying to figure out the future and, and what was next. So yeah, very grateful for that. What a model spouse and wife you have. That's incredible. Yeah, she's been really fantastic. So after that decision's made, you are feeling crushed, but you're putting one foot in front of the other. You're going to work every day. How long were you really kind of broken up about this or how long were you kind of down in the dumps? You know, it affected me for a long period of time where, you know, even now I look back on it and say, wow, you know, that would have been really a really neat thing to do. Um, 
But I feel very fortunate that I was able to pick myself up almost immediately and get right back to work um, and figure out what's next. You know, I didn't want to, you know, sit around too much because I knew that that wasn't going to improve my situation. That was really up to me to figure out what I needed to do to be where I needed to be. And so while my wife was away, she took a trip, you know, to visit family for a month. And I went out to another state. So I went from Nebraska to Iowa to sell there for a little while. And it was late one night after being completely exhausted from my sales day. And I was reflecting on what I wanted to do in college, which was become an entrepreneur, but on the tech side. And one of the challenges in school is that I had all of these ideas and I would collaborate with friends and we had all of these ideas, but we always struggle with finding a technical co-founder. You know, yeah. in this day and age, you need somebody to do the website um, or you have an app idea. There's always somebody that has to be on the ground doing the work. And I respected that. And it was very difficult to find that technical co-founder. I think that's a pretty common thing for entrepreneurs is, you know, we have ideas, but it's hard to find somebody to actually implement them because that's where a lot of the value is. And so anyway, in Iowa, late one night uh, after a sales day, I decided that, you know what, I'm going to learn this for myself. Uh, I'm going to learn to program so I can build my own prototype. I cracked my laptop open that night and that's when I really started learning to program. Just learning through Googling and teaching myself and that's, that's when I did it. That's kind of when the moment started. What language did you start off with? It was Python. And I didn't really know anything about programming languages. Um, I probably Googled around a little bit about, you know, which ones to learn. And it turned out to be the perfect one for me in my career. Um, so I got a little lucky in that sense. But, you know, for the rest of the summer, I really didn't have a lot of time or energy to learn programming. But that's kind of where it started. Um, yeah. After the summer, I didn't really have, you know, too many plans or prospects. And so we decided to move back in with family to regroup a little bit and figure out, you know, what we we're going to do next. And uh, my brother-in-law was very gracious and he provided me a job that I could do on the side. It was mostly manual labor working in a, a metal shop, which was uh, cool, but obviously not really what I wanted to do, but it was something to do in the meantime. And yeah. um, in the evenings, I was taking online classes. Um, I decided at that point I probably needed a real job for based on, you know, a real career that I could pursue to support a family and realizing that the entrepreneurship would probably come later. But, you know, I wanted to do things that sort of fit into that long term goal as well. Um, so I was taking online classes that were related to programming and a lot of the technical side that I wasn't familiar with at that time. Graduated college the previous spring. Yeah, so this was all. Were these classes like Code Academy type classes or were they like through a university or how did you find these educational courses? Yeah, so they were massive online courses. Um, they were just free online. The platform that I was using is called edX. It was brand new at the time. So I was still trying to, you know, build that technical background, but at the same time realizing, you know, I needed a real job. And so I was looking for companies that sort of fit that profile yeah. um, based on my interests and, and skill set. And uh, when I was working in college with this professor, the one that I was telling you about before, it was more on the biomedical side. So I had some interest in, you know, helping people in that way. and. Um, whether it's related to medicine or, or biotech or something like that. And so I was looking along those lines and there was a company that I became familiar with in college that I was revisiting and um, I looked at it and, and saw what they did and I thought, you know, this is perfect. You know, this is kind of my dream company. This is what I need to do because it's this blend of business and, and technology that was really interesting and really cool. And I thought, you know, no better way to um, learn and, and prepare for my goals and, you know, contribute to society and support a family than through this company. And so I thought, you know, this is, this is going to be my new goal. This is going to be my new dream company that I'm going to pursue. And so over the course of that next year, it took me quite a while. Um, I was taking online classes to prepare, um, on the programming side and everything that I knew was important to this company to prepare myself to be able to make it. Part of that process was that I knew that there was yet other things on the biology chemistry side that um, I wasn't prepared enough for. And so I came up with this five year plan. I said, you know, I'm not going to work for this company right away. They're not going to take me right away. I'm going to go work for all of these other companies first or not all of them, but you know, one or two get some experience along the way. 
and then maybe prepare myself to go work for this other company. So I kind of have this long plan to realize yeah. my goal. And so then while I was going through this preparation process, I heard about career fair on the other side of the United States in the Northeast. And it was a little biotech career fair. Like there wasn't a whole lot there, but I thought, you know, I just have to go for it. And it, once again, that leap of faith. So I wasn't making a lot of money, uh, obviously in that, you know, temporary position, but I decided that I'm gonna do what I need to do to go out for a week even, and put myself up in a hotel, all the airfare and everything, not only go to the career fair, but it was sort of a biotech hub. And I thought, you know, I'll leverage my door-to-door -door salesman experience and go door-to-door -to, -door <laughs> yeah. to these biotech companies yeah. until I find somebody who hires me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of my leap of faith. And so I did, I, I flew out there and went to the career fair, talked to some companies, um, you know, went door-to-door, -door, so to speak, to some of the companies, the biotech companies in the area. And one of the things I didn't anticipate, which totally makes sense, is that a lot of these companies were, you know, more or less on lockdown, if you will. Like their security was high, they weren't letting people in and out. And some dude, even though he, he's uh, in a button down with a tie and look sharp, you know, if you don't have an appointment, you're not gonna be able to get in. Um, there yeah. was a couple of instances where that wasn't true and I was able to get in and talk to some people. Um, had some good conversations, but most of the time they said, you know, I really like what you're pitching, but obviously, you know, we don't have a role that's already ready for you. This is hard for us to do. Um, and so didn't work out. Yeah. So I came from this week long trip where I put it all, you know, spent a lot of money and put myself on the line and all of that. And again, another major disappointment. Um, all of these other companies that I was engaging with to try to, you know, as stepping stones to, for my five-year plan to go to this other company, none of them would take me. And so I felt like my plan was already dead from the outset because nobody would even take me. Um, and I didn't have enough experience to get in the industry any other way. And so I felt like I was, you know, done for and all on all fronts. And then, um, once again, I decided I'm just going to go for it and, and do what I need to do. So I emailed this, this company that I was interested in, said, hey, I want to work for you. What do I need to do? And they said, you know, we don't have any positions open right now, but reach out to us again in six months. And so um, that's what I did. I spent the next six months preparing, studying, taking more classes, doing what I needed to do. You know, I, I remember, you know, while working this temporary job for the half hour lunch that I had, sitting up on the table and reading books and going through notes and doing, you know, my math equations, everything I needed to do to prepare in that very small window of time, taking advantage of every moment. Um, so that six months later, sure enough, I reached out again and they said, hey, we have an opening. Why don't you apply for it? And I got the job. And so it's turned out that my five year plan wasn't even needed, that the company that I was aiming for, it took, you know, a little bit more time, but they hired me directly. Um, and so then everything kind of fit into place. And um, what's really amazing, what's such a, a neat thing for me was that during the interview process for this company, I had an idea pop in my head, kind of, you know, that um, stroke of genius that an entrepreneur, entrepreneur might have. And I thought, you know, this is going to, I don't know if this is going to be relevant to this company or, you know, why I have this idea, but that could be something that I could do. And, you know, I thought, you know, I don't know how to achieve it. I don't have the technical expertise yet, but, you know, I kind of have this idea of how it can be achieved. And so then I ended up um, going to work for this company. And I should say that I started as an intern. So I definitely had to get in at the very bottom of the company. And I had the most amazing manager, you know, going back to what I've been talking about before of having those key relationships all along the way. She really enabled me and uh, she was amazing. And you know, probably a little bit annoyed with me too, because here's this brand new intern. I was on the job for maybe two weeks and I went into her <laughs> office and I said, Hey, you know, I have this idea and I want to do it. <laughs> She's probably thinking this isn't why we hired you. Yeah. Yeah. Go do your job. <laughs> it took you a lot to get here. Don't mess it up now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she was very gracious and she said, yeah, go for it. And she gave me some time to do it. And over the course of some months, I started pro prototyping it and 
at home in the evenings, I was taking yet more classes and doing projects to try to build the skill set that I needed, which was related to machine learning. And that was the first time where I was really becoming proficient at programming and machine learning. It was never out of interest so much to um, develop those skills. It was always to, you know, as a means to an end to be able to accomplish my goals. And so over the course of months, and it was even like a whole year, I had been prototyping this thing. And so then I finally had something that I could show my boss where it was kind of working. I was very excited about it. And, you know, we had conversations all along the way. So she kind of, this wasn't a surprise. She was sort of seeing things come about. And I said, I think I'm ready. And I said, I want you to invest in me as a company. I want, I want to realize this vision. And she said, all right, well, let's talk about what that might look like. And so I pitched to her, I did a little pitch to her and she approved it. The summer sales skills coming back, you made the pitch, what'd she say? Yeah, she said, this looks really good. Let's take it to the next step. And so um, we set up a meeting to pitch to her boss, who was the VP. And so we did a lot of preparation and then we gave the pitch to the VP. And she said, no, she said, we were not gonna do this. And man, <laughs> once again, the year of preparation and thought and investment, you get become really personally invested in these ideas, right? You spend so much time yeah. on them. And so, yeah, right. it was another, another letdown, but I couldn't feel any kind of resentment because in talking with my supervisor, we learned that you know, it was to protect us because you know once you start a project like that and you're talking to higher ups, you know there's a lot more exposure and if there's failure, then a lot more is at risk for us personally in our careers. And so in a way she was looking out for us. It wasn't so much that she thought it was a bad idea, but she thought that, you know, let's, it's too early, too early, probably too early in our careers to, you know, do something like this. And, you know, I went back to my desk and I felt pretty crushed. And I was thinking about, you know, what do I do uh, in this situation? Do I abandon the idea and keep doing my daily job, which I was paid to do, um, hired on to do, or is there something more here? And I was sitting at my computer and I drafted an email to the president of the company. And how I started the email is I said, I have a problem. And my problem is that I have an idea and I need some help to realize this, this vision. And I printed out the draft and I walked down the hall to the VP's office and I said, hey, look, you know, I know we had this conversation, um, but the last thing I wanna do is I wanna step on toes. I said, I've drafted this email to the president of the company and I'm not gonna send it if you feel like, you know, I shouldn't send it, but I want your blessing on being able to send this email. And she looked over it and she was probably a little bit reluctant, but she said, yes, that's fine. You can send the email. And so I sent the email to the president of the company and outlined my idea. And he said, all right, let's set up a time for the pitch. The time came. We did a lot of preparation on that. A lot of preparation. Yeah. And we pitched the idea. And he said, I love it. It almost felt like a blank check. He said, I'll give you whatever you need to, to realize this. Do you need more people? Do you need more resources? I got uh -huh. this person that I know, this person that I know, these companies. He said, let's make this happen. Wow. And so then um, I was able to recruit with me, one of my close friends, a coworker um, there at the company. And we were full time on this idea for over a year. And uh, we had, you know, any resources we need through people at the company and compute resources. There's just the two of us. It wasn't like a big team. It probably, you know, wasn't a huge uh, expenditure or investment on the company side, but they let us go for it. And, you know, a year later, we set a timeline of a year and we actually made our deadline. We, we hit our goals, we realized the vision, we published on it, we went to a conference and presented on it, and it's now integrated into our products. People, people wow. buy our product. Where did you learn, who taught you, how did you learn every step of the way you said, there's this big risk, I decided to go for it, and then it was a failure. And then another one came up, and I decided to go for it, and it worked. And then another idea came up and I decided to go for it. It was a failure. And then it worked and then it failed. It's like, it's like you have never ending enthusiasm or you are only down and out for like an hour before you're on to the next opportunity 
the next thing, you're picking your head up and you're saying, what's next? Somehow you have the ability to pick yourself up and try again, and not everybody has that. So my question for you is, how, how were, you, were you taught this ability as a kid? Are your parents this way? Did you have some teachers in school and church? Why do you think you know how to do this? I think this is a very unique skill. I don't think that most people are, I mean, or maybe you make it sound easier than you've felt at the time, but somehow you've learned this skill. You know, I think that uh, why it's difficult to reflect back on and, and figure that out is because I think it's hard to pinpoint any single experience along the way. I definitely yeah. think it's something that's built up in me over a long period of time. Um, you know, the earliest instance that I can think of is that uh, I was homeschooled for elementary school and junior high. So I went to high school, but um, my parents, they didn't really know math. And I had a math book and they basically handed it to me and said, Kay, don't forget to do your math. Hmm. And I remember being really late at night and I was sitting on the stairs in our house and reading this math book and trying to figure out, figure it out by myself. You know, I didn't have a teacher to teach me how to do it. And it was just kind of this realization of, you know, if I want to accomplish this, it's really on nobody's shoulders but my own. You know, I'm, I'm responsible for my own success. And so I don't say, I wouldn't say that it was easy for me in that moment, but it was more or less this realization of, you know, I have the power to make the, the decision for myself, to, to do it for myself, and then just kind of going for it. Um, I think a lot of this comes down to intrinsic motivation. You know, my goals have never really been external. If they've never been like things or titles that, you know, I want to achieve. It's all, you know, how do I become a better person? Um, you know, how do I improve myself? And, you know, realizing or recognizing in those moments where, you know, especially moments of weakness of, you know, I'm down and out or I'm not feeling capable of this, but it's really up to me to improve myself and to be a better person. And just that realization was really motivating me for me early on. And then just practicing that over time, you know, because not being able to figure out math is a lot, you know, easier of a problem to face than, you know, preparing for a year for something that I really wanted to do and not being able to get in. Um, so, you know, those small things early on certainly helped with the big things later on. But yeah, I guess you could just say just coming down to the realization that, you know, it, it's really on my shoulders and then making the most of whatever situation comes your way. Yeah, no, that's a great lesson. I think we could all take these small instances and learn from them. And for the next one, you might be able to take on a little bit of a bigger task or a bigger instance. Isn't there like a... Uh, a math equation where a domino can push over the next domino if it's half as big and so then you can start with one that's this small and in 10 dominoes you're pushing over like a you know 100 foot high yeah totally where there's there's untapped potential and yeah. it's realizing that you know you have to take those first initial steps to realize the later you know big opportunities and to not be afraid of taking those small steps even though they might not seem very significant and one other thing that I could allude to as well is earlier on in our conversation, um, you know, you asked me about advice for students in school yeah. and trying to figure things out. And one of the things I mentioned is, you know, being open to change, being open to being wrong and, you know, having uh, conversations with people to help guide you along that way as well. And I think that that also plays a role here as well, where um, you just need to be open to circumstances and realize that, you know, even though things seem bleak now, that there might be a greater purpose. There might be something even greater that you don't realize down the line that you'd be able to realize. So for me, I thought I had to go to that program to be a technical entrepreneur. But little did I know that those um, experiences being a salesman, um, taking those classes, and making those connections all played a role so that I'd have an idea pop in my mind, you know, and I was prepared when that moment came and that I had this entrepreneurial experience in my company yeah. that maybe I wouldn't have had if I went to that program. 
And so maybe I yeah. learned more important lessons along the way through that journey, through that process, than that one program that I thought was important for me to get that experience. Well, you were rolling with the punches and you ended up on top. You ended up where you wanted to be about four years earlier than you expected. And that's not a bad thing, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, but there's also the sense of nervousness, to be honest, that uh, you know there's more pain yet to be had in the future and just being you yeah. know, ready to learn those lessons as well when, when those experiences come. I think I've heard it said, you know, everybody is either just experienced failure or is about to experience failure. And how you define failure, you know, is, is kind of, it will mold your outlook and it will mold your attitude about when you hit that roadblock. Are you going to, you know, crumble or stop and be impeded or are you gonna just walk around it and find a new path? Well, Josh, this story that you've had has been really cool, very enlightening. I mean, I've learned a lot about you and a lot about what you've been doing the last number of years and just the integrity that you had to say no to your dream program because you already had committed to the numbers of ups and downs, to the number of you know relationships that you've kept that have been key and uh, the skills you've acquired. It seems like you have an extremely um, like logical way to think about the next years of your life. You know, it's, you've said you've sat down a couple of times and planned out the next year, the next five years, and you just execute them on, execute on those plans. I think that's really impressive. That's really cool. So I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. Hey, are you reading any books? Do you have any recommendations for us on a, on books to pick up and read? Uh, recommendations for books. Um, you know, one book that comes to mind, it's not one that I'm reading now. It was about a year ago that I read uh, by way of recommendation. And I think it was on Bill Gates's yearly five books or something that he recommended as well. Um, it's called Bad Blood. Have you heard of Bad Blood? I haven't, no. So Is bad, it fiction so or nonfiction? It's uh, nonfiction, it's investigative journalism. So Bad Blood is about the story of Theranos. As entrepreneurs, we focus often on the success stories and the ones that inspire. But this one I would frame as more of a cautionary tale. And, you know, it reads almost like a suspense book. You know, you have to, it's a, it's a real page turner, it really is. But it's really kind of heartbreaking to realize that there's these types of relationships, the, the bad types of relationships that exist in the world, especially when you're under pressure or you're trying to realize a goal or a vision. Um, that you can make huge mistakes along the way, especially with people. And, you know, so not only is that a really entertaining read, but it's really important for, I say, anybody who's interested in pursuing ideas or entrepreneurship to realize you can't forget the humanity or the human component of what you do. Um, and probably that would be the one thing that I'd emphasize in, you know, our story today as well is really the people along the way are in of themselves your true success. You know, I look back on my experiences and it's not the projects, it's not realizing goals, but it's those people, my real treasures that I made along the way. And so I'd say definitely read Bad Blood just as a really good reminder of that's truly what's important in whatever you're doing. Well, that Theranos story is just insane by itself. So to have someone who is, you know, dig in and, and understand it and write a book, that's, that's great. I'm going to check that one out. Hey, if anybody who is listening has any questions about machine learning, chemical engineering, some of these things that you've been interested in or have had experience in, is there some way that they can reach out and get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. Always happy to help any questions that might come up. Um, yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach out to me. Um, I think you'll probably have my name in, in the video or the comments, but yeah, or even, even provide a link is just fine. Well, Josh Staker, Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Great story. Uh, I loved interviewing you. So thank you for sharing with us. Yeah, thank you, David. It's been a real pleasure.